the Sony a7 IV is one of the most exciting mirrorless cameras, and for good reason. This camera is packed with features, there is so much that you can do with it, and that actually becomes a problem in that it takes a long time to get to know this camera and to make sure that you're getting the most out of it. So for that reason, I'm doing this video today to share with you 11 custom settings that I do to this camera to help me with my hybrid photo and video shooting. I'm gonna share with you the initial settings that I tweak the moment that I unbox this camera before I start shooting with it, as well as deep dive into some of the custom settings that I tweak, including my memory recall settings, custom buttons and dials, the function menu, and my menu. Hello friends and welcome back to the studio. This is Susie with Gemini Connect. If you guys have been following our channel for a while, then you might know that a lot of our content here has to do with action cameras because the GoPro is the primary camera that we use for travel vlogging. However, I'm also a professional photographer and videographer. That's how I make the majority of my money and I've been doing that for the last 10 years. And so for my professional work, I now shoot exclusively with Sony mirrorless cameras. Before the a7 IV, I had the a7R 3 as well as the a6300. So I've been around Sony cameras cameras for a while, but the a7 IV has some new features that I'm really stoked about, so I'll share some of those with you in this video. Because there's so much packed into this camera, I cannot talk about every single setting. These are just my custom settings that I use. I know that a lot of you out there probably use your own, and for that reason, I really encourage you to read the manual of this camera. It's really helpful, and also watch other people's custom settings videos, because there are quite a few out there now. And I've even watched about seven other a7 IV settings videos and I learned so much. I've tweaked my own workflow based on those other videos. So it doesn't hurt to get opinions of what other people do with this camera. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off the audio signals or the beeps that happen whenever you press the shutter of your camera. So we're gonna hit the menu button and scroll down to settings. If you've used any previous Sony cameras, you might notice that this camera has a totally new menu system. It's a lot easier to navigate and I really appreciate that. From setups, we're gonna scroll down to audio signals or sound option and then to audio signals. And make sure that this is off. By default, it's turned on and I'll give you an example of what it sounds like. Isn't that just really annoying? It's really annoying, really amateur. You just don't want those sounds. So if you make sure that your audio signals are off, then you won't have those sounds. Next, I'm gonna make sure that the shutter button is now also the record button. So on this camera, there is a red record button for filming videos, and by default, the shutter button won't work uh, to film videos either. It only works for photos. However, I can change that. If I hit the menu button, and then go over to setup, down to operation customize, and down to the record with shutter. So by default, this is off. So if you try to hit that, uh, shutter button to record. It says the movie record starts only with the movie shoot button. So you have to change this setting, turn it on, and now whenever I hit the shutter button, that means I can start recording as well. So I just find that to be really helpful as a hybrid shooter who is often switching between photo and video settings. The next thing I do is I turn off the autofocus illuminator. This is something you only have to worry about if you're in photo mode. In fact, if you're in video mode, you won't even be able to see this, so make sure that you switch over to photo mode. The AF illuminator is a red light that appears usually whenever you're shooting in low light settings. That red light helps you autofocus, but it can also be really distracting and annoying. So I personally don't like having that on. I like to go ahead and turn it off. And we can do that by hitting the menu button Go over to AF slash MF and down to AF Illuminator and just make sure that that's off because by default it's on auto so it is going to turn on whenever you're trying to shoot a photo in low lighting. The fourth thing that I do is I change the photo and video file names. So by default, your photo and video files have these letters that make up their names. For photos, it's DSC, and for videos, it's C followed by a number. And that's just really random. You can actually change that in the camera. So to do that, we're gonna hit the menu button and then go over to shooting. We're gonna then go down to file and file folder settings. And from here, we can do set file name. 
So in this case, I am in photo mode, so I've already changed this to be A7 IV as opposed to DSC. And I like to do that because I often shoot with multiple cameras, so it's really nice to know that these are the files that come out of my A7 IV. And for photo mode, you're restricted to only three characters, but if you switch over to video mode, and you can actually change the name to be longer than three characters. So in this case, I'm keeping it also A7 IV, but I'm making it A7 IV as in the Roman numerals, because that does help me differentiate between my photo files and my video files. The next thing I do is I add my copyright information. And this is something that you only do in photo mode. You can't do this to your videos. But if you're over in photo mode, you go to menu, and also in this file area, you just go up to copyright information. And you can turn, make sure that this is on, and you can set photographer and just put your name on there. And that makes sure that all the photos that are taken with this camera have your name on them. And it's just a lot easier to do this in camera. You can also do it in post-production using something like Adobe Bridge or Adobe Lightroom, but this just makes it a lot more seamless and make sure that you have your copyright information attached to all of your photo files. This next setting I'm super excited about, but it's new to the a7 IV as well as the a7S III, but it's the ability to have different photo and video mode settings. So on this camera, there's a dial here and you can switch between photo mode, video mode, and S and Q or slow and quick mode. And by default, your settings stay the exact same. And that's not good because your photo settings and your video settings should be very different. And so if you enable this setting, you can have your custom photo settings and your custom video settings. So to do that, you wanna hit that menu button, go down to setup, operation customize, and different set for still slash movie. You get this little warning screen, but just hit OK. And now you can make sure that all of these boxes are checked for the settings that you want to be different whenever you're in photo mode versus video mode. I find it really helpful to have aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and picture profile especially to be different. So I make sure that those things are checked and then I hit OK. Now, if you're wondering what my exact photo and video settings are, I'm gonna share those with you really soon. But first, let's go ahead and set our image quality. So by default, this camera is set to shoot only JPEGs, as well as I believe it's 1080p video. So it's not the highest quality video or photos, and for me, I wanna change that for sure. So you wanna hit menu, shooting, and image quality. And you do wanna make sure that you're in photo mode or video mode to change this. In this case, we're in photo mode, so let's take care of that first. But our image quality, I wanna set this to JPEG. There are some other options here, this HEIF. So if you select this, you're gonna get high image quality and a smaller file size. However, the catch is that you might not be able to view or manipulate some of these HEIF files because you need certain gear in order to do that. So personally, I don't mess with that. I just stick to JPEG. Now under that setting is image quality settings. And this is where you can select if you wanna shoot in RAW, RAW plus JPEG or JPEG. Now for me, I prefer to shoot in RAW because that gives me a really big file, but it is a file in which I can better manipulate in post-production. So if you plan to do post-production on your images and you have something like Photoshop or a good image editor, then you might wanna select RAW, but if you don't know what you're doing with RAW, then definitely don't do this because it is gonna complicate things quite a bit. So you can feel free to you know, stick with JPEG or do a combination of RAW and JPEG if you're not sure and you want to experiment. But if you do want to shoot raw, then make sure that this is selected. And this is what I do. Now let's switch over to video mode and also set this image quality. So for this one, it's the same area, shooting image quality, and we're going to change the file format. So by default, I believe it's uh, this HD option, which is 1080p, perfectly fine if you, know, you don't want a huge file of the highest quality, but I personally want to be shooting in 4K. These other options down here, 4K, I, oops, I forgot that I have touchscreen enabled, but I just demonstrated what happens whenever you do select that. So this, I believe, is the highest quality of video that you can shoot, this SI 4K. However, if I select that, then it gives me this warning that I need a faster memory card. So I had to order a new memory card in order to have this function enabled. But for most of us, we don't really need the highest quality 4K. We can shoot this version of 4K just fine using a slower memory card. 
So again, this comes down to personal preference and what you're willing to deal with as well as, you know, what kind of image editing soft or video editing software that you have access to. But for me, I'm going to stick with this lower version of 4K for now. So under file format is movie settings. And from here, you can select your frame rate. I tend to be down at 30p or 24p, but you can go up to 60p. But just be aware that that is going to increase the file size on your video. And below that, we have record setting, which allows us to choose our bit rate, our color sampling, and our bit depth. So as a rule of thumb, the higher these numbers are, the higher the image quality, and also the bigger the file size. So I'm going to be up at 140 megabits per second using 422 and 10-bit color, but that does mean that I'm going to have a really giant file size. So if you want a smaller file size, you might want to be down at this value here. Next, we're going to go down to S and Q settings. S and Q stands for slow and quick, and this is where you can select slow motion video or quick would be for time lapse shooting. So for S and Q settings, we're going to go into, first of all, frame rate. I'm going to select this to be 24p. Next is S and Q frame rate. And for this one, you might be capped at your values based on the image quality that you chose. And because I'm in 4K, the highest number I can select is 60 frames per second, which does actually give us two and a half times slow motion. But if I want to get down to something like 120 frames per second slow motion, then I'd have to change my file format, downgrade it to 1080p, the HD, and then go over to S and Q settings. And now I can select 120 frames per second. And that is five times slow motion. But you might notice that when I do that, I do have this restriction again of my memory card being too slow. So you do wanna make sure that you have a really fast memory card. And if not, you can downgrade to 60 frames per second. And that still gives you two and a half times slow motion. Now, if you're not going for slow motion, you can also change this down to something like one frame per second. And that would give you like an in-camera time-lapse video function. There are quite a few other different values in between one frame per second and 60 frames per second. You can do some experimenting to figure out which ones that you prefer. But these are the two extremes that I tend to bounce between the most. Next, we're going to set up our memory recall. So on this camera and most other cameras that are like it, you have a dial up here for selecting your modes, such as auto, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, and these numbers here are your memory recall. So you can program certain settings whenever you have the dial uh, switched to these numbers. So for the sake of demonstrating this function, I'm gonna show you the settings that I tend to have whenever I'm shooting still photos using a speed light flash. So I'm often in manual mode, and my shutter speed is down to 1 1 25th of a second. And I usually have my aperture at f4, and my ISO, it's usually at about ISO 640. And so once I have those settings down, I'm gonna go over to menu, shooting, shooting mode, and camera set memory. And then I can select one, two, or three. So I'm gonna select three for this one, and just hit OK. So now I'm gonna go up to this dial here, and I'm gonna go over to, you know, P. I'll show you that the settings have changed, but if I switch them over now to three, it's gonna give me those settings that I just made as my memory recall. But the main setting that is really helpful to designate here is my picture profile mode. So you might have heard of S-Log3, which is Sony's really flat picture profile. So whenever you shoot in this in Sony cameras, your video is going to come out really dull and muted in terms of color. But that means it's preserving more dynamic range. So it gives you more flexibility to color grade that footage in post-production. And so to get there, we're going to go to menu and scroll down to exposure and down to color slash tone. And here you have picture profile. So it really sucks that Sony likes to use these little codes here, but PP8 is where you would get your S-Log3 and PP11 is a newer one that came out, I believe, on the Sony A7S III, but that's down at PP11. And this is s Cinetone. And so it's Sony's picture profile, which is a little bit more color graded. So it's not as bad as S-Log3 in terms of needing post-production. You could shoot an s Cinetone and be able to use that video straight out of camera. 
And so if you like to flip between your picture profiles like I do, this is something else that you can set in your memory recall, which is really helpful, especially in your video modes. And this is also a reason to differentiate your settings between photo mode and video mode, because if you are shooting in video mode and you are using a picture profile and you don't have those different settings, then whenever you switch over to photo mode, then your photos are gonna be shot in this S-Log3 kind of flat style, which isn't really good for photos. And so that's something that you can prevent by having different settings enabled for your photo mode and your video mode. The next thing I'll do is I'll customize my function button settings. So on the back of the camera is a FN or a function button. And when you do that, you get like a little menu here of some settings that you can quickly go to. And so if you ever want to change any of these values, you can do that in the menu. So you want to hit the menu button and go down to settings or setup. Go over to operation customize and FN menu settings. These menus are also split in half because you have a different function settings for photo mode versus video mode. But if you wanted to, you can program these to be the exact same. So I personally really like the default features that are here. The only one that I swap out is over in the photo mode. So in this section here that's orange, by default it's creative styles or creative filter, which I never use for my photos. So instead, I change this over to be silent mode. And this allows me to shoot photos uh, with a silent shutter so that the shutter isn't making noise. The only problem though with shooting in silent shutter mode is that if you're in an indoor setting with artificial lights that are LEDs, then you're gonna get some flickering or some banding that's gonna happen in your photo. So that's not always ideal. So for that reason, I tend to flip a lot between silent shutter on and off. So I like having it there as a quick function. But since I'm talking about the function button, let me tell you about some of the settings that I do turn on and I almost permanently leave them on. The first is in video mode. I make sure that my focus peaking is turned on and I like to have the peak be mid. So focus peaking is when the parts of your video or your photo that are in focus are highlighted a certain color. And you can designate that color in the menu. I like to have mine on red, but it just really helps you verify that you are indeed in focus and what exactly is in focus in your shot. It's extremely helpful and in photo mode it's only available if you're shooting in manual focus but in video mode you can now have focus peaking enabled if you're shooting in manual focus or autofocus. So really handy to have. The other function that I turn on is down here. This is steady shot or the in-body stabilization in the camera. And I like to have it on active, which is the highest mode of steady shot. There's also standard or off. And the thing though about shooting in active is that it does crop into your frame just a little bit, but it gives you the most stable video footage. So for me, that's worth the cost. All right, almost done. This is the 10th thing that I do in my camera, and that is I designate custom keys and dials. So all of these buttons back here on the camera, as well as the dials, these can be customized to whatever settings you want them to be. And so to do that, we wanna hit the menu button and then go over to setup. Go over to Operation Customize. And this custom key slash dial set is where we can designate the features for each of the buttons and dials. The very first is the auto exposure lock, and this helps me reframe the scene but keep the current exposure from changing so it maintains the brightness between my shots. The next is the auto focus on button. So whenever you half press the shutter on the front of the camera, that already triggers the autofocus. So this button is kind of redundant unless you really like to have your back button autofocus. So I reprogram this to instead be APS-C crop mode. And whenever this is enabled, I can crop into my frame just a little bit. And that makes me feel like I have two lenses with me because it just gives me a different frame of view. But if you're shooting in photo mode, it comes at the cost of making a smaller file size. So you wanna use that somewhat selectively, but I personally use that function all the time. The next button is C1, and I program this to be focus magnifier. Whenever I press this button and look into my LCD or my viewfinder, I can zoom into the shot just a little bit and it helps me verify if my subject is in focus. I use this a lot. 
The next button is C3, and I have this program to silent mode on and off. Because, as I mentioned earlier, whenever I'm shooting photos, I'm often shooting in silent mode, but it's not always good to shoot in silent mode. So this way I can toggle between on and off at the click of a button. And the last button is C4, or this trash can button down here. And I have this program to touch operation select, which basically means touch screen on and off. Because sometimes it really helps to have touch screen function to set your focus point, and other times it's really annoying. So I like to be able to turn it on or off. Next, this little dial back here has little buttons that can be customized. So I liked most of the default options, but I changed two of them. The first one was the center button here. I changed this to be face or eye detect on and off. And the reason is sometimes you want your camera to automatically focus on eyes or faces, and other times it's annoying. That's not what you want. So I like the option to toggle that on and off at the press of a button. And the next one, I believe this is actually default, but if it wasn't, I really like where this feature is. But the joystick here, if you press the center of it, it's focus standard. And so focus standard is really helpful because sometimes, you know, you use your joystick to move your focus around, but then you want your autofocus point to be back in the center. And so if you have focus standard enabled, then that just recenters your autofocus point, and that's super helpful. And the rest of these keys and dial modes, I really just left them on default. I don't feel the need to really change any of them, but if you want to, then you can. And the very last section that I customize are my My Menu items. And so for this one, you can press the Menu button, and then if you scroll to the very edge, and you go up to the top, there's this star. And so here, you can program this whole menu area to some of your most used menu functions. And so I have some of mine here, and I think that there are two that are really worth bringing up. The first is Format. So whenever you do this, you can format or erase your memory card. And I do this usually at the start of every shoot, so it's really hard to find format in the regular menu area. It's like hidden deep in the setup section, and so I like to have this really front and center and easy to access. Another setting that I like to have fast and easy access to is my monitor brightness. And so you can have this set to manual or sunny weather. So sunny weather makes it much easier to see your LCD if you're shooting outside. It just brightens up your entire LCD. So that's really nice to have, but if you're ever indoors and you definitely don't want sunny weather, you'd probably rather be in manual, where you can you know, bump it yourself or even lower the brightness of your LCD. But anyway, we're now at the very end of this video. These are 11 settings that I customize in my Sony a7 IV camera. I actually do this for every single brand new camera that I get, but I deep dived into how I did it on my Sony a7 IV, just because this camera has so many different settings. It is a beast of a camera to get to know. And so I hope that this video was helpful. Uh, leave me any questions or comments in the comment section below, and I'll try to answer them as fast as I can. But thank you for watching. Stay tuned for part two, in which I'll talk about 12 additional settings on the a7 IV that you might not know about.